and before drama surrounding the election, the saga of former Nissan chairman Carlos Ghosn captivated the business community and the world. Nearly one year after his dramatic escape from Japan, where he faced charges of financial misconduct, Ghosn is speaking out from his home base in Lebanon. In a new book titled The Time for Truth, he lays out his version of the events that led to his arrest and escape. I caught up with Ghosn yesterday and asked him whether he thought the new U.S. government would or should at some point intervene in his case and the ongoing cases of others in his orbit. Listen. For me, as a, as a foreigner, I'm a little bit surprised that there is a, uh, an agreement between the U.S. and Japan uh, on extradition, because knowing, uh, you know, uh, I have lived in the United States, I've seen uh, firsthand uh, the legal system in the United States, and frankly, the defense exists, the judge are really the bosses, prosecutors doing their job, it's a kind of very balanced system. Well, when you take a look at what's going on in Japan, where the prosecutor is the boss, the judge is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, nice organizer, and uh, the, the, the defender have practically no position, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what's the logic of two systems as different as the one premier, uh, uh, existing in the United States and the one in Japan leads to uh, cooperation between the two countries and extradition between the two countries. It's, it's still a mystery for me. Yeah, and of course you're referring to Michael Taylor, uh, who has been yeah. extradited by the State Department and the DOJ now pushing the federal judge to reject a last minute request by him and his son to be extradited to Japan for helping you escape. What was your reaction to hearing that decision? Uh, uh, shock. I, I, I was never expecting this to happen because I, I have been, uh, unfortunately, experimenting the, uh, the system in Japan with uh, all uh, its, um, you know, uh, uh, uncomprehensible, you know, uh, difficult to understand way of treating suspects and uh, sending two American citizens to go through the system uh, by the administration. Uh, and I, I, can, I cannot uh, think two seconds that they're not aware about, uh, you know, the extremes of the Japanese system is for me very difficult to understand. There's also Greg Kelly, who's dealing with the Japanese system as well, your former top aide who's on trial there for, for allegedly helping you under-report pay. Have you had any contact with him? Uh, no, unfortunately, no, because I would uh, put him in uh, jail for that. He, he, is, he is forbidden by the prosecutor to have any contact with me. I can contact him, obviously, because now I'm free in uh, Lebanon. Um, and uh, this, is, this is also an interesting case where Greg Kelly has been held back in Japan for now two years. Uh, his trial has started on one charge, and the charge uh, is uh, uh, complicity in... Uh, uh, not stating a compensation which has neither been decided nor paid, which is, again, a very difficult to understand. He has been held back in Japan for two years. He's going to go for a trial. It's going to last one year. God knows what's going to be the consequence of this trial. But, uh, you know, and I, I remind you that he has settled in the United States for a, a relatively modest amount. With, with so, so you have a total imbalance between what's going on in Japan and going on in the United States, which is fine, except that we're talking about U.S. citizens. Right. What do you think is going to happen to him? Look, I, I think if there was some kind of justice in Japan, he, he, he is obviously in. Uh, now, uh, if, if he's innocent, then uh, Japan has a problem because it mean, I've been arrested, uh, by the way, for this same charge uh, for no reason, which obviously will have a lot of consequences. Uh, not only on their system, but also uh, on Nissan, which uh, in a certain way uh, colluded with the prosecutor uh, to uh, establish uh, this uh, machination, this call. I read the book. I learned a lot about the history of the auto industry and, and the alliance that you built. Nissan, Renault, the success that you had. Why, why ultimately do you think they turned on you? Well, because they did not want any additional convergence between Renault and Nissan. They were afraid that we would be heading toward a merger. And frankly, I was against the merger uh, uh, because I'm convinced from a management point of view that it would be a complete mistake to merge the two companies because then we will end up with, uh, you know, first rate citizen, second rate citizen, which usually is at the base of the collapse of many mergers. I was against it, but they thought that 
I would collude with the French government to establish a merger, even though I was against it, and they decided just to get rid of me in a way which, frankly, is neither subtle nor very smart. You call it old Nissan. You refer to for the company that you led. When did you realize that that old Nissan was working against you? Well, old Nissan had always worked against me since 1999. When I arrived in 1999, you can imagine that a lot of uh, you know uh, Japanese were against the fact that the foreigner would come, we would turn around successfully a major company and would become a, some kind of a role model in the industry of Japan, a uh, model for change, model for globalization, model for openness, etc. So uh, they like it. I, I knew they existed to the company. I didn't want to fight them. I want to fight them uh, not by, you know, persecuting them, but by uh, demonstrating to them that this is the way to go to a strong performance of the company through a strong growth, through profit, and through a good vision and a nice strategy. Uh, unfortunately, at a certain point in time, uh, because of this exacerbation of a nationalistic point of view, due, I must also say, to maneuvers coming from the French side, which was not very smart, we ended up into the situation where this alliance is collapsing, even after 17 or 18 years of remarkable work. Uh, and this alliance, after having reached uh, the uh, status of the largest automotive group in the world in 2017 and 2018, uh, is today crumbling. What would you tell a foreign CEO that was considering taking a, a job atop a Japanese company? Uh, make, sure, make sure before you go that the hostage justice system in Japan has changed, frankly. I, I mean, I, I never... I, I had some suspicion on the justice system in Japan when I've seen so many scandals of a Japanese company where never a Japanese executive was arrested or was tried. Um, uh, you know, we had the Fukushima uh, problem, we have the uh, airbags of Takata, etc. And frankly, even though there have been a lot of casualties and a lot of, I mean, nobody, nobody, nobody really paid for that, which was surprising for me. But I never thought that uh, we will end up with the system where uh, uh, the prosecutors uh, uh, prevailed in 99.4% of the cases. It, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I didn't know that, even though I uh, lived in Japan for 19 years, I, I never thought this statistic was serious. But having been through the system, I'm a little bit surprised that it's only 99.4%, that it's not 100%. When you planned your escape, it, obviously it was daring. There's a lot written about it. Did you ever think it wouldn't work? Oh yeah, I, I knew I knew it was risky, but you know what? I uh, I was already in hell, uh, so probably the risk is if if I fail, I would be in a darker corner of hell. But if if this was successful, then I would be in a completely different world, and that's why I think it was worth it, even though it was it was very risky. But uh, all the tricks, uh, the dirty tricks in a certain way used against me, that mean I was forbidden to see my wife or to talk to her. I was forbidden to see some of my children or talk to them. Um, uh, I, I didn't have any speedy trial. Every, that mean they started to tell me that uh, the trial is going to last four to five years. And I would be happy if uh, I end up only with one guilty. I mean, all the dirty tactics used to get me to a confession. Uh, get me to a confession, uh, show the real nature uh, of the system in Japan. And the system, which, by the way, is fought internally in Japan by a lot of lawyers and some of the opposition party who are really uh, considered that the system is uh, uh, not at the same level of the country, that in the country is not served by a system like, uh, like, like this. So uh, for me, getting out of the system was the only objective if I was ready for this, for the ultimate sacrifice, which was, if it would fail, I, I knew that, uh, you know, there would be no redemption. Will you ever leave Lebanon again? I hope so. I hope, uh, I hope so. I will, I will leave Lebanon. I probably will never go back to Japan unless they change the hostage justice system, uh, their hostage justice system and uh, opposition party take uh, the leadership of the country. Uh, that's my only hope if one day I want to come back to Japan. Uh, but I hope that I will be able to fight the red card, the red notice uh, from Interpol and be able to lead. And it's possible because you know that 
Interpol usually doesn't get involved uh, into cases, uh, in three cases. First, if there is a violation of human rights, well, uh, in my case, I have uh, plenty of demonstration of this. The second, if there is a political interference, in my case also, I have everything to prove it. And third, if uh, the case does not, uh, 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 you know, is not part of the normal local system, uh, legal system, and even the Prime Minister of Japan said, I wish the story would have been sold into the boardroom of Nissan. So well, I, I have all the reasons to attract the attention of Interpol that they should just give up uh, caring of this story, which means to remove uh, the, the red card. And in this case, what's going to be left is only I cannot go to Japan. Where, where would you want to go? Well, obviously France, uh, Brazil, United States, where my uh, my children live uh, and uh, the children of my wife live uh, everywhere in the world i mean i'm not i'm not unhappy to be stable in in, in lebanon today but uh, at a certain point in time i want to recover uh, my freedom of uh, of move uh, for a very simple reason is uh, i'm innocent what else can we expect from you carlos in, in the near term everybody's waiting for the the james bond style movie to come out well i don't know I don't know if it's going to be a gem stuff, but anyway, you're going to have a documentary and you're going to have a fiction. Uh, the documentary is going to be retracing exactly the facts uh, of what uh, what happened. And you're going to have a lot of witnesses. Uh, you know, in, in this kind of story at the beginning, when, uh, when the incidents happen, uh, people are afraid to talk. Uh, fortunately for me, little by little, they start to open their mouths and tell the truth. Uh, and that's that's what I'm hoping for, that at the end of the day, in front of the powerful attack launched by Nissan, Japanese prosecutors supported by members of the Japanese government, uh, and really, unfortunately, by, by uh, a kind of uh, uh, silence from the French side, uh, that people who have seen what happened and are able to witness and help me reestablish the truth. Our thanks to Carlos Ghosn, speaking out for the first time since he arrived in Beirut in early January. By the way, we reached out to Nissan for comment on Ghosn's allegations there, and here's what they said. Nissan carried out a robust and thorough internal investigation that included external lawyers based on substantial and convincing evidence found in the investigation. Nissan established that Carlos Ghosn and Greg Kelly intentionally committed serious misconduct and significant violations of corporate ethics. The company contends that the facts surrounding the misconduct will be shown during the court proceedings and the law will take its course. Wilfred won't happen for, for Carlos Ghosn as long as he stays in Beirut. And, and you heard him as long as that Interpol red alert is out on him, the international organization that, that helps police try to arrest or locate people and then extradite them. Lebanon doesn't have extradition with Japan, which is why he's there. He has his freedom of speech as well, and he's obviously using it in interviews like this and in his new book, The Time for mm -hmm. Truth, that's just out in and France and, and around the world. I thought it was such, such a good interview, and it, it, it reminds us of that extraordinary story in, in the first place. So many things jump, jump out to me from it. I mean, one of them is him saying something that we all learned when the story came out, this uh, amazingly surprising figure that 99% conviction rate, and that despite him living and working there for so many years, he hadn't even really been fully aware of that. He gave a, a, a clear warning there uh, to people that would potentially want to uh, go and live and work in Japan. That probably is, is what must hurt the, the Japanese authorities the most, to see that uh, that kind of message uh, displayed out here. But, but the other interesting thing on, on that point is, is the statement you got there from Nissan saying, you know, he, serious breaches of ethics and uh, misconduct. I mean, maybe they'll prove that, but I, I think uh, as as members of other democratic developed societies, even if breaches of ethics are proven, it doesn't justify in our understanding of what is fair in the eyes of the law and injustice, the level of solitary confinement for so long that, that he received there. And again, it just highlights that very different approach uh, in, in, in Japan that, that so many of us weren't really fully, fully aware of uh, a couple of years ago. Well, and that's exactly the case that Carlos Ghosn is trying to make. And that's what he calls the hostage justice system of Japan. Interestingly, we did get word recently of a foreign CEO going to lead a Japanese company for the first time really since this ordeal. Mitsubishi Chemical has, has courted a French CEO despite the risks that, that Carlos Ghosn just laid out and that, that you just shared. 
And even Prime Minister Abe, before he left, despite all of this, at one point did say this kind of matter is really one, so sort of, sort of regrettably, that, that's really for corporate governance, the sort of white collar criminal investigation. The charge was about understating compensation for retirement, which Carlos vehemently denies. But, but even that, to your point, rising to the level of detention and punishment that he faced in Japan, I, I think it does call, call a lot of attention to that issue and, and to the, the system in Japan. We'll, yep. we'll see if anything happens. Well, yeah, uh, and we do uh, need to wait for the trial and see where he uh, rises and uh, whether he's proven to be guilty of something, uh, even in his absence. So I guess it wouldn't necessarily be proven guilty in, in that sense in the same way as we understand it. But that